This is a part of the Oziegen Forum on Modern Turkey, uh, which the Center for European Studies has been mounting since uh, 2015 and is made possible by a generous gift from the Oziegen family uh, on the occasion of uh, Mr. Husnu Oizegan's um, uh, 70th birthday. We were hoping he would be here today. He was hoping he could be here today, but there was a last minute minor mishap, and so uh, he is not, uh, but he has been a strong supporter of the Centre, and as many of you will know, he's a very prominent businessman in Turkey, and indeed uh, one of the most um, uh, impactful philanthropists uh, in uh, contemporary Turkey. His uh, uh, foundation has achieved important advances, I think, in the realms of education, health, and rural uh, development. And uh, we're very glad to have this opportunity to uh, make issues uh, in um, uh, Turkey and around Turkey uh, central to what we do at the Center for European Studies. And it's a special pleasure for me, uh, really a personal uh, pleasure, to introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood uh, Randall. Uh, Liz uh, is a trailblazer and um, Many of us knew that quite some years ago uh, because uh, Liz, uh, who has an undergraduate degree from Harvard University, was the very first uh, undergraduate research associate at the Center for European Studies. And uh, lest you wonder whether that was much of an achievement, I will tell you that is at a time when we did not have undergraduate research associates. We thought of ourselves as a graduate institution and it was simply the force of Liz's intellect and personality that led us to change that policy, and many have followed in her footsteps there. Uh, Liz went on to do a doctorate in international relations at Balliol College, Oxford, my own uh, alma mater. Uh, uh, any of you who've read Anthony Sampson's book on uh, anatomy of Britain will know that he describes a variety of British institutions, and uh, what he says about Balliol College is Balliol College is full of people who put a great deal of effort into appearing effortlessly brilliant. Uh, and I can tell you that's true, and I can tell you that some of them are actually brilliant, and um, that Liz's dissertation was published as the book Allies in Crisis, uh, Meeting Global Challenges uh, to Western Security in 1991. Uh, following that, uh, she's had a very distinguished career in public service. During the Clinton administration, Liz was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, uh, where she played an important role in the effort to denuclearize uh, that region of the world. Uh, this is work for which she was awarded uh, the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service uh, and the Noon Lugar Trailblazer Award. So indeed the government recognizes you as a trailblazer uh, as well. Uh, Liz went on to serve as Special Assistant to the President uh, and Senior Director for European Affairs on uh, the National Security Council. Uh, she was the President's Principal Advisor on Turkey, uh, hence she is here today, and she guided the development and implementation of U.S. foreign uh, and defense policy towards Turkey uh, during the crucial years of um, President Obama's first term. And then uh, most recently, uh, from October 2014 to January 2017, uh, Liz has been a Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Energy, where uh, uh, leading a department of uh, more than 100,000 employees with a series of missions, including uh, nuclear deterrence, a global proliferation prevention, science and energy, environmental management, emergency response, and grid security. In other words, a, whole, a, a wide set of missions which the uh, current uh, Secretary of Energy may have been somewhat surprised to discover uh, belong to his department. So uh, Liz has made uh, major contributions to American public life. She's a deep thinker about international relations. She's deeply engaged with uh, Turkey, uh, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, reconsidering the Fractured Alliance, Lessons Learned, and Future Prospects for the United States, Turkey, and Europe. Liz, thank you very, very much for coming. I'm very touched by that introduction. If I'm a deep thinker, it's because of people like you, Peter. I, I was here as an undergraduate. I came, it is now unbelievably, 40 years ago. Uh, to be a freshman at Harvard, and I was literally awestruck by the brains here at this center. We were originally over on Bryant Street um, in a little house, and this it was just an electrifying community, and I aspired to 
become, as Rumania was saying to me, become like some of the people I was exposed to. I n knew that I could never be like them, so I did not stay in the academy because I did not have that intellectual capability, but I sought to apply my interests in Europe to working on the challenges of our times across the years that, that Peter has described. And it's just an enormous joy for me to be back in this place. And uh, I said to Elaine, as soon as I got here, I want to stay. Can I find something to do? Because it's such a place of, of um, warmth and ferment. I am very honored to deliver this lecture in this uh, relatively new lecture series that has been uh, given to the center. Although, as you heard, Mr. and Mrs. Uzin, I'm working on the pronunciation, have unfortunately been delayed in their arrival in Cambridge um, and can't join us today. I want to express my thanks to them and especially to salute them for their vision uh, in joining with partners here at the center in creating this series, uh, 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 both the lectures and also the focus in a number of seminars at the center on the importance of Turkey in Europe. The contributions that are being made to a sustained Harvard focus on Turkey are vital to our shared future. And I honestly can't think of a more important topic for this center to take up as a research priority in these times and for you to discuss in your seminars and meetings and conferences and annually at this named lecture. Um, I have worked on Turkey for many years, and um, I'll add a little more on uh, what Peter said, because I came to work here at the center as the, the first undergraduate research associate in very different times. And I did uh, pester the center to let me be connected in that way. Um, I had come to Cambridge after studying for a year in between high school and college in France, and I was immediately drawn to this energetic and intimate and exhilarating community that had been founded by Stanley Hoffman and Guido Goldman. And um, at the time, the U.S. Soviet paradigm was, the U.S. Soviet uh, competition was still the dominant paradigm in global security affairs. And there was a fixation uh, in the U.S. government on the question of what would happen if communist parties were elected, uh, le legitimately elected to participate in Western European governments. What would U.S. policy be toward those parties? And so a book was in the works here, and I asked if I could be a research assistant to Professor Hoffman on that book in my freshman year. And that opportunity really shaped my life. Um, and uh, it gives me great joy to see that the center has, has thrived and that it is as vibrant a place as it, is, uh, as it was 40 years ago. I've stayed involved in the center over the years. We had a, a strategic review group that I participated in a number of years ago thinking about the future of the center. Um, I came 10 years ago this month to give a lecture on Turkey, which was called the Fractured Alliance, the United States-Turkey and the future of transatlantic relations. And it was with sitting here with Stanley Hoffman that I had the opportunity to speak on this subject. Um, and so we come back here today to ask this question about the future of US-Turkey relations, Turkey's place in Europe, and Turkey's future orientation, which really is the uh, <coughs> current set of questions that we have to wrestle with. And for those of us who studied under Stanley, who have been influenced by those who studied under Stanley, I will say one of the things that he taught, which is in some ways out of sync with contemporary uh, work in political science, is that history really matters. And so uh, I want to think about what is happening today in the context of what has come before. I don't think there's any way we can really understand it without uh, evaluating what precedes the place we find ourselves. So in classical Stanley fashion, I want to approach these remarks by dividing them up into three sections. Uh, first, a look back at the forces that forged the U.S.-Turkish post-World War II relationship. Second, a look at the past eight years, the years in which I did have an opportunity to play a role in the shaping of American policy toward Turkey. Uh, <clears throat> and third, a look at the future, although I will uh, uh, say right now that that obviously is um, one that is only uh, conjectural because we really can't know what's going to happen. And I was saying to Peter that anyone who would agree to give a talk at Harvard just days after this referendum was voted on really needed to have her head examined. So <laughs> we're going to have a conversation about the, what we uh, anticipate for the future. 
In framing these three sections, I want to just start with something that I hold in my mind as a way to think about Turkey, uh, which is to be open to holding opposing ideas about Turkey in our brains at the same time. And that's also true to Stanley's legacy, uh, because he resisted single variable explanations for anything uh, and taught us to seek to understand the multiple factors that are at play in both the past and the present. Uh, but it's very intellectually challenging. And some minds are more comfortable with doing this kind of thing, of holding these opposing ideas in their head at once. And there's a very insightful book that's written on this called The Opposable Mind, which was written by a former Harvard Business School professor uh, named Roger Martin. And it makes the point that some people are able to approach intellectual challenges by being able to keep that tension alive in their brains, and that it can ultimately lead to more generative and forward-looking analysis and outcomes. And just as an aside, I'll note that President Obama had that capacity. It was a quite remarkable uh, skill that he brought to the table as we were evaluating policy options and making decisions. But it is frustrating not to be able to give a single explanation uh, that explains what's happening satisfactorily. And in Turkey today, frankly, it's very hard to get to truth about what is happening. Uh, or to predict where it's heading, because there's so many compelling uh, th competing themes and dynamics at play. And I'll just give an example of this. I was struck there was a series of interviews that were conducted by the Washington Post and published this April 16th, so just a few days ago. And they were interviews with young Turks in both the United States and in Turkey. And the interviews were as if they were discussing the same country, but literally living in alternative realities. Uh, and of the same age group, but seeing what had happened, what uh, Erdogan is doing in very, very different ways. Now, truthfully, you can say some of us feel the same way about things happening in the United States right now, that people are living in alternative realities. Um, but if we go back to the formative period after the Second World War, when the structures uh, were being put into place for post-war global governance and international alignments, we can see that the emerging Cold War division of Europe uh, became the prism through which Turkey was seen by the West. And that shaped both our perceptions of Turkey and our engagement for many decades. And given the urgency of security issues, as the Iron Curtain began to fall across Europe, including on its southern flank, our relationship with Turkey was very much shaped through this lens of realpolitik, strategic concerns, and much less focused on domestic political matters. Specifically, when NATO was established in 1949, there were concerns that uh, NATO was established, Turkey was not an original member of NATO. There were concerns that drawing the line for NATO membership in a way that included Italy but excluded Turkey and Greece would invite Russian adventurism on the territory of the countries excluded or in the areas around those countries. And so shortly thereafter, in 1951, both Turkey and Greece were invited to and acceded to NATO membership. Turkey was seen that by the United States and our other allies through that lens all the way through to the end of the Cold War as part of the defensive periphery of Europe. Turkey had the largest military in NATO after the United States, and it brought both strategic location and important capabilities to the alliance's arsenal. Turkey sent 15,000 troops to fight alongside American troops in the Korean War. And as the alliance uh, studied and evaluated the lessons it learned in Korea about the need to significantly enhance its military capabilities, its standing military capabilities, Turkey brought very important assets to the collective defense pact. So I set that as the stage because I think one of the issues we're wrestling with today is that for a very long time what was going on in Turkey domestically didn't really matter to the United States. And it's only much more recently that we've become so much more focused on uh, democratization in Turkey and the, uh, in the creation of a multi-ethnic uh, and tolerant state. In the interest of time, I'm going to move ahead to the period of the late 1970s and early 1980s, though we can talk in the discussion about other events along the way if you want to, where there are similar examples of how the United States looked at Turkey and how Turkey responded. Um, 
but the uh, spotlight was placed again on Turkey as the United States began to wrestle with the issue after the oil crisis in the uh, early 70s of access to oil in the Persian Gulf region, which became a, a quite an obsession for the U.S. government. Um, and uh, it saw Turkey as a key partner in securing that access. So in November 1982, the United States and Turkey signed a memorandum of understanding that permitted the United States to modernize 10 existing Turkish air bases and establish new ones as well. And this became an important role that Turkey would be asked to play uh, over the ensuing decades, that is to facilitate access for the United States to get to the Middle East and Southwest Asia. But from the very start, and this is quite important, and indeed it harkens back to what happened during the 1973 war, uh, uh, in which uh, the United States sought <coughs> access through Turkey and the Turks were very uncomfortable with uh, that request. Turkey expressed discomfort with the role we were asking Turkey to play. And indeed, from the start, put limits on use of these bases and on use of Turkish assets. And these actions, if we examine them, reflected legitimate concerns that Turkey had about antagonizing its neighbors, the neighbors it had to live with every day, and its unique position as a NATO ally that was also positioned at the crossroads of East and West and of the Christian and Islamic worlds. Patterns established in that period would foretell the challenges that we have experienced subsequently. For example, Turkey played a critically important role in reversing Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait during the first Gulf War. Prime Minister Rizal's decision to shut down the uh, Kirkuk Jehan pipeline at great economic cost to Turkey proved to be very important in isolating the Iraqi regime. While Turkey didn't take part in Operation Desert Storm per se, it provided logistical support to coalition forces at those strategically located Turkish bases that I mentioned. However, the second Bush administration's decision to invade Iraq on weapons of mass destruction grounds created much greater strains in the U.S.-Turkish relationship. Turkey repeatedly warned the United States against the invasion and then experienced significant direct consequences. The planning and implementation of the invasion involved intense American pressure on Ankara to allow the 4th Infantry Division to transit Turkey. Um, but Turkey ultimately did not acquiesce to that pressure. And following a vote of the Turkish legislature, the answer was no. U.S. forces cannot transit Turkey. This was viewed by the Bush administration as a breach of faith, of alliance commitments. Uh, they, their view was, as some of you will recall, you're either with us or against us. And coupled with several subsequent events, this, what was known as, what is known as the Second Iraq War, created a rupture in the relationship that would fester and that would not uh, be addressed effectively until the beginning of the Obama administration. So the key themes that emerge in this period, that's a more recent period shaping what we are dealing with today, um, as we saw early on in NATO, are related to Turkey's <coughs> multiple orientations, both its internal dynamics and the regional threats to its sovereignty and integrity, uh, which are such that it naturally does not perceive security challenges in the same way that the United States and other NATO allies do. And in this case, uh, US, in the case of the second Gulf War, U.S. policy and actions exacerbated challenges that Turkey saw as much greater and more significant than the United States did. So that brief history obviously does not do justice to many things that happened along the way in Turkey, in the United States, and in Europe. We could spend a whole seminar, for example, discussing the long and disappointing history of Turkey's interest in and Europe's response to its interest in joining the European Union, and the impact of the European Union having invited Cyprus to become a member prior to Turkey. In general, however, the historical record that I've touched on here highlights key themes that would repeat themselves for us in the Obama administration, and that's the second chapter that I want to present to you today. In late 2008, I was asked by the incoming National Security Advisor, retired General James Jones, to join the White House National Security Team on day one as the Senior Director for European Affairs and the uh, Special Assistant to the President. General Jones, uh, many of you may know, was the Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. 
and, and that, uh, the, that is SACUR in NATO parlance. And as a colonel, he had been responsible for Operation Provide Comfort, uh, later Operation Northern Watch, which protected the Kurds uh, in northern Iraq by enforcing the no-fly zone. Jim and I had worked together previously, and we had spent time when he was secure in Belgium during the Bush administration discussing the challenges facing the Atlantic Alliance due to the aftermath of the Iraq invasion that had been very divisive for NATO writ large. But we also discussed specifically the importance of figuring out a way forward that enabled us to rebuild the relationship with Turkey. From the very start of the administration, we discussed how critical it would be to repair the damage that had been done and the trust that had been broken with Turkey over Iraq and our subsequent actions in the region. At the time, Turkey seemed to be on a promising path toward strengthening its democracy. The prime minister, now the president, had strong credentials as a local leader. He had himself been imprisoned while mayor of Istanbul for what we would describe in the United States as exercising his First Amendment rights to freedom of expression. As such, there appeared to be an opportunity to work together toward the expansion of a multi-ethnic inclusive republic that would strengthen civil liberties, grow the economy, and partner with us in the region and beyond. From the very outset of the administration in 2009, we prioritized a strong relationship with Turkey. Just a little over two months after President Obama took office, we embarked upon the President's first overseas trip to Europe. It was a multi-country expedition which included a G20 summit in London, in which the Turks participated, a NATO summit, a summit with all EU leaders, and an historic visit to Turkey. At the NATO summit, summit in Stra which was uh, shared between the French and the Germans, so part of it was in Strasbourg and part of it was in Kiel, and subsequently, at the EU leaders' meeting in the Czech Republic, Turkey played a very significant role. This story hasn't yet been told in detail, but it was a defining experience for the relationship. At the NATO summit, there was an extended debate among the leaders about who would become the next NATO Secretary General. There was considerable, considerable support among the leading countries of NATO for Danish Prime Minister Rasmussen. However, there was some resistance, especially from Turkey, particularly on the grounds that Turkey believed Denmark had not been tough enough on preventing European financial support to the PKK, and that the handling of the cartoon scandal in which a Danish newspaper had published a number of political cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad had not been appropriate. President Gül, who represented Turkey at the summit made a strong case that if Rasmussen were to be chosen, there would need to be some counterbalance in the form of a new leadership role for Turkey in the NATO hierarchy in Brussels. His demands didn't go down very well with a number of NATO leaders. And the summit uh, uh, stalled on this issue, and President Obama went to work negotiating a solution behind the scenes. Rasmussen was chosen. And Turkey found an opportunity, was given an opportunity for leadership in Brussels that it had not previously had. But there were to be some repercussions of this going forward. And that took place immediately. We went on to the Czech Republic for an unusual meeting of the EU leadership with the new president. So it was all the leaders of EU countries, not just the European Council leaders, but all EU heads of state or government with President Obama. And at that meeting in the Czech Republic, President Obama, um, I will say that it was a striking moment because coming into that room, you could feel the compelling nature of this young American leader who had come to listen to and work with Europe and, and build a relationship, as I noted, with Turkey, but true for the rest of the allies as well, based on trust again. We came to the heart of Europe. This was a country, of course, in the Czech Republic that had been behind the Iron Curtain. And it had been born again after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact and had already become a member of NATO. So there was a lot of symbolism in this meeting. Now, the Turks were not present at this meeting, of course, not as members of the EU. But President Obama made the decision to make a very deliberate point at that meeting um, of stating his objective for inclusion of Turkey in Europe. In the face of evident opposition from a number of European leaders, he said, 
The United States and Europe must approach Muslims as our friends, neighbors, and partners in fighting injustice, intolerance, and violence. Moving forward towards Turkish membership in the EU would be an important signal of your commitment to this agenda and ensure that we continue to anchor Turkey firmly in Europe. I recall the frisson and indeed some bristling among the European leaders when President Obama made those remarks. They were skeptical about what taking in Turkey would mean, and indeed the bruising experience the day before at the NATO summit suggested <coughs> caution to some of them. Would Turkey <coughs> prove to be a disruptive force in the halls of the European Union, or would it actually play a constructive role? This was not settled at that time, of course, uh, but those early 2000 discussion, 2009 discussions hearkened back to some earlier debates that we had about the scope and domain of NATO and about Turkey's unique status as a country that bridges and spans cultures, ethnicities, and geographies. And then, after Prague, President Obama put an exclamation point on the statement he had made in the Czech Republic by going on to Turkey. It was the only exclusively bilateral visit of the European trip. And he gave a landmark speech to the Turkish parliament I'm going to read you a little bit of that speech because it was a very important statement in his mind about how he wanted to approach Turkey and the Islamic world. He said, some people have asked me if I chose to continue my travels to Ankara and Istanbul to send a message to the world. And my answer is simple. Evet, yes, Turkey is a critical ally. Turkey is an important part of Europe. And Turkey and the United States must stand together and work together to overcome the challenges of our time. He went on, the United States strongly supports Turkey's bid to become a member of the European Union. We speak not as members of the EU, but as close friends of both Turkey and Europe. And then he went on to make a critical point, demonstrating our recognition of Turkey's centrality. I know there are those who like to debate Turkey's future, he said. They see your country at the crossroads of continents and touched by the currents of history. They know that this has been a place where civilizations meet and different peoples come together. They wonder whether you will be pulled in one direction or another. But I believe here is what they don't understand. Turkey's greatness lies in your ability to be at the center of things. This is not where East and West divide. This is where they come together. In addition to expressing this new vision for our relationship with the Muslim world, this speech set forth a renewed approach to working on issues of, self, of shared interest, and he outlined these as the most important, significantly expanding ties of commerce and trade in order to rebalance the relationship away from what I had described as the heavy dependence on security cooperation, facilitating the transit of oil and gas through Turkey to Europe to create more energy security for Europe, advancing democracy and in that context, religious freedoms, and he specifically called, he sp sp specifically spoke about the importance of the Halki Seminary. And finally, working together to address and potentially resolve a number of regional conflicts. Relatedly, in a little watched sidebar, President Obama went on to Istanbul for a meeting of the Alliance of Democracies. There he waded into an issue of importance to Turkey, Nagorno-Karabakh. And he met there with the ministers of foreign affairs of both Armenia and Azerbaijan. He'd only been president a couple of months, and a Swiss mediator joined them, who had been working quietly to achieve a lasting solution to that conflict that created a, not only a uh, huge, uh, uh, bled both countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, obviously, but also was creating a significant impediment to the normalization of relations between Turkey and Armenia. Unfortunately, a solution at that time and subsequently was not to be, but it was an early introduction to him to the interwoven and complex nature of relations among the countries in the region. Finally, in a surprise move at the end of the European trip, the President went on to Iraq. And while I won't delve into that, it reinforces my point that everything that mattered to Turkey was also on the agenda of the new President of the United States. And this is further demonstrated by the extreme care that President Obama took in deciding who he would invite to the White House in the first year. Uh, there was always a very healthy debate as uh, those of us who represented different regions of the world would come into the Situation Room and talk about the people we thought should come. And we were sending a message to the world about who we invited. 
And there was a lot of discussion about this. Nothing was casual or unintentional. So by the end of the first year, not only had President Obama traveled to Turkey, but he'd also invited Prime Minister Erdogan to visit him at the White House, a meeting which took place on December 7th. The symbolism and the substance was very significant. Our goal was to reinvest Turkey in its bilateral ties with us, in its role in NATO, and in working with us throughout the region, especially in dealing with the challenges that were posed by both Iraq and Iran. Unfortunately, by 2010, a series of incidents in the late spring created new strains in the relationship. And these included Israel's blockade in May 2010 of a flotilla of ships that was trying to deliver relief supplies to Gaza, and which resulted in the deaths of eight Turkish citizens and a Turkish American aboard a ship called the Mavi Marmara. And almost immediate, immediately following that, Turkey chose in June to vote against a resolution in the UN Security Council uh, that was very important to American policymakers uh, that was uh, designed to impose stringent new sanctions on Iran's nuclear weapons program because we were working to build the pressure on Iran so that we could ultimately get to a negotiation about the program. This vote, candidly, came as a surprise to the White House and caused a lot of displeasure uh, in the halls there. As a result, there was a big debate about what our reaction should be. And the President had, in principle, agreed to go to a meeting. He was supposed to go to a G8 and a G20 meeting in um, Canada later in June. And there were those who thought he should cancel. Uh, and he had agreed, in the context of that, to see Erdogan in Toronto. And there were those who uh, uh, thought that that meeting should be canceled as a display of our disappointment, our anger over the uh, vote in the UN Security Council. But the President chose to play the long game and said, no, I'm going to go ahead and meet with Erdogan. Um, he did so because he felt it was important if he was building a partnership that he needed to speak candidly uh, about his concerns and do it as an ally and a partner. Um, and I think this was a very significant moment in the relationship. There was a toughness in that discussion, but it was also a there was also recognition on the Turkish side of how much this mattered. And uh, the Turkish team tur took notice. And although currently I can't describe the ways in which they responded in detail, uh, the Turks chose subsequently to cooperate with us on a number of important uh, immediate policy matters. And I'll just stop there and say I think it's an example of how in international relations the relationships between leaders really matter. Those are different relationships than every other relationship. And leaders, in my observation of them, speak to each other differently. They occupy a different space together. And they relate to each other in a way that others don't relate to one another. Um, and so the time that uh, President Obama took to work with Prime Minister Erdogan was impactful, though obviously not dispositive, uh, in shaping outcomes. But over time, the relationship continued to face challenges that reflected divergent core interests. And that is always in alliances where uh, we face challenges. So President Obama continued to meet with Prime Minister Erdogan. And they had very lengthy phone calls. Prime Minister Erdogan would want to talk for 90 minutes, for example, which was something highly unusual for President Obama. President Obama was very efficient about things. Erdogan wanted to have long conversations. And of course, there also had to be translation. Uh, but the initial glow of that early period that I described to you had certainly faded. And then in 2011, Syria began to unravel. At the time, I recall worrying about the impact that the situation in Syria would have for the management of the Kurdish issue in the context of U.S.-Turkish relations. Amanda Sloat, you will remember this well. Experts uh, across the government had different views about this. Some disagreed with me, but unfortunately, I was proven right. And as Syria deteriorated, its territory became ungovernable and occupied by a variety of groups with divergent affiliations. We sought a way forward that would protect Turkey's sovereignty and also address its concerns about the use of Syria and Iraq as safe havens for Kurdish terrorist groups. But the murkiness and fickleness 
of the opposition groups, as well as the possibility that Kurdish groups would actually hold terrain that neither President Assad nor the emerging extremist forces, now uh, described as ISIS, would control, meant that the United States saw them as a potential partner in dealing with Syria, and ultimately would provide the Kurdish forces in Syria with equipment and training. But this, of course, created additional strains with Turkey. We did seek continued opportunities to realign on Syria. We didn't give up on the effort. One of these presented itself in 2012. I was still responsible for Europe then, and the Syrian regime shelled towns across the border in Turkey itself. We pushed NATO, because this NATO has a commitment, an attack on one is an attack on all, the Article 5 uh, guarantee, we pushed NATO to make the decision to deploy Patriot batteries in Turkey immediately to provide defensive capabilities against such attacks from Syrian territory. And several allies, including the Germans, the Dutch, and the Spanish, joined us in this effort. The deployment was complicated, but it was a symbol of NATO support for Turkey. Over time, I would say, however, the Syrian situation has been a net negative for U.S.-Turkey relations, especially as the U.S. also saw Turkey as being insufficiently determined to prevent ISIS from using Turkey as a transit country for foreign fighters, supplies, and finance. On other issues of significance, we diverged further as well. Most importantly, Erdogan reversed his initial and very promising opening to the Kurds domestically and reverted to a policy of repression. This stimulated further domestic challenges, including terrorist acts. And it was not the only area, of course, in which domestic reforms seemed to be put into reverse. Across a wide spectrum, diverse voices were silenced, including through a draconian repression of the free media. In addition, progress stalled on opening the Turkish border to trade with Armenia, something the President has, had sought as a sign of goodwill that could benefit both countries and diminish Armenia's isolation. And because, as the Nagorno-Karabakh process went nowhere, there were increasingly deadly skirmishes between the Armenians and the Azeris. Iraq also deteriorated after the U.S. decision to dramatically reduce its presence there. The Turkish leadership was very disappointed in that decision, arguing that it would enhance Iran's influence. Further actions taken by Erdogan raised concerns in Washington, including repeated purges of the military, the most extreme of which took place following the coup attempt last year. Turkey's threats following that coup attempt to expel the United States from one of the bases at which the United States stores nuclear weapons dedicated to NATO's defense was a stark demonstration of how derailed the vital security relationship between our two countries had become, and frankly called into the question the future of Turkey's relationship with NATO. So that is how we find ourselves, our, ourselves together today asking this question, what can be done to repair this fractured alliance? What does the future hold? This is the period, as I noted at the beginning, that is the hardest to talk about. First of all, because we don't have any distance from it. And perhaps even harder, because in both of our countries, there are trends that do not augur well for a strengthened partnership moving forward. We have to approach this moment with humility, I think, as it's difficult to fully understand the implications, the full implications of the steps that Pre President Erdogan has taken or of the recent referen referendum that was uh, narrowly approved by the Turkish people. Now, the same could be said for the United States at this time, although the institutions of our democracy and civil society are much stronger and more resilient. We don't know what the purges taking place at institutions of higher learning in Turkey mean for the future of Turkey, but they are very worrisome. We don't know what the impact of recent developments will be for the economy which had already slowed considerably from its earlier, much stronger performance, but investor confidence has clearly been deeply shaken. We do know that opposition voices are being repressed and free media is being severely constrained. What this means for the longer term is also not yet known, although it appears to be very negative. Finally, the treatment of the Turkish military over the past few years, which had been widely respected as a secular institution in Turkey, 
will fundamentally affect Turkey's future, but we can't yet discern what that will mean. The military is no longer a pillar that can be counted on for stability. Indeed, the purges executed by President Erdogan have decimated the officer corps, which means that those with whom our military had long cultivated relationships and trained may, longer, may no longer have any role or influence whatsoever. Further, and also very worrying given the tremendous instability on Turkey's borders, the capabilities of the Turkish military may be deeply compromised. Taken together, these trends are suggestive of a phrase first used by Fareed Zakaria 20 years ago uh, when he described such, such, such situations as being those of illiberal democracy in which the institutions of democracy are used to pursue a path that leads away from democratic principles and processes. This could paint a very dark picture for the future of Turkey with profound implications for the Turkish people first and foremost, as well as for the United States, for NATO, and for the region. But the lessons of the past suggest that there will be divergent tendencies in Turkey, and therefore that its path toward democracy or away from democracy will not be linear, nor will it necessarily follow a model that is familiar to us. We've seen times in which it appeared that Turkey was becoming at once more democratic, more nationalist, and more Islamist. That was true in the period of the early 2000s, after Erdogan came to power. And today, the democratic dimension seems to be in retreat. But there could be a break with this trend and a return to a more democratic path, one that's still true to the original vision that Erdogan put forth, but from which he has so dramatically appeared to diverge. We've seen other discontinuities in countries that have taken us surprise. And here again, I do think leadership can matter. There's nothing that is immutable, as we've seen just in my lifetime. And I'll note a few things. Civil rights have been substantially expanded in the United States for African Americans and for women. The Cold War division of Europe which I read in my time as an undergraduate would never end, ended relatively peacefully. Nelson Mandela walked free after 27 years in Robben Island prison, and apartheid was abolished in South Africa. So it's important to note that things happen that surprise us, that we don't anticipate, and where all the evidence points in the opposite direction. Countries with a long and strong history, such as the United States and Turkey, with many shared interests, need to continue to work hard to build opportunities for cooperation. And I will say here, and this is different from what shaped the relationship initially that I talked to you about, the exclusive focus on the security dimension, the fate of Turkish democracy matters to the United States and to Europe. And yet the question of how we can effectively engage in a way that strengthens the hand of those who are seeking to hold the ground against what appears to be gro the growing authoritarian power of President Erdogan has not been answered yet. President Trump's phone call to President Erdogan following the rep referendum has been widely criticized in the media. But I've thought about it and I have a slightly different view, which is that there's a great benefit in talking to each other and that what would be more dangerous at this juncture would be to isolate Turkey <coughs> further or cut it off from connectivity to countries that can speak truth to power, which the United States and our allies in Europe can. And reflecting back on the past decade, I would say that some of the anti-democratic trends that are most worrisome may have been exacerbated by Turkey having felt rejected or diminished by those it sought to expand its ties with such as some of the leaders of the European Union. When the EU's promise of the offer of membership was the greatest, Turkey made significant strides with Erdogan as prime minister toward a number of democratic reforms. And there's a very interesting piece by Stephen Cook in the Sunday Washington Post on this subject. So my belief is that we must stay engaged with each other. And a group like this, the scholars uh, and practitioners here who have the opportunity to have dialogues with Turkish colleagues and speak on Turkey, write on Turkey, should continue to do so. Because we need to find a way forward that fulfills the hopes of the people of the United States and the people of Turkey to live lives of peace and prosperity and opportunity. So 
Well, I thank you for giving me the chance to talk with you about Turkey today, and I think we're going to have a dialogue now in which we can talk about Turkey and any other topics you want to take up. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Bill. If you can get your microphone to work, is mine working? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Or, if you don't Definitely. need it, can you hear me? Um, uh, we will have a chance for a, some sort of dialogue, and I'm happy to entertain comments or questions. Um, yeah. I'd ask people to identify themselves Please. if they would like to intervene, and I'll recognize people. Maybe I can uh, begin, uh, uh, Liz, by asking a little bit about the very last thing you said, which is um, uh, really the issue of whether the U.S. Um, decides to press for uh, democratic outcomes mm -hmm. domestically in mm -hmm. Turkey or not, whether or not th that decision is made, um, to what extent do you think the U.S. still actually has any leverage over that kind of issue? Um, I, I, and I ask this question partly uh, thinking also about the Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a specialist in international relations, but uh, my impression is that uh, the key role that Turkey has played in uh, uh, putting the cork in the bottle of uh, migration uh, through that part of the world mm -hmm. uh, has uh, shifted the balance of influence in some significant mm -hmm. ways and made it very like difficult for the leverage. European Union mm -hmm. to uh, uh, put pressure on Turkey if it wanted to. Uh, especially with regard to domestic uh, issues, issues of democracy. So, um, you know, you might have views about both sides of that. Am I right about the European position? And uh, whether or not I am, uh, if the U.S. wanted to press uh, for uh, more as opposed to less democratic outcomes on the domestic front, does it still have any leverage there? So first of all, I would challenge you on the notion that you're not an expert in international relations. Oh, well, that's all right. I, I'll, I'll accede <laughs> to you on that Thank point. You, Peter. Right. Uh, so this is hard, and it's, it's a, um, I think hectoring Turkey will not be effective. So mm -hmm. getting up on the soapbox and, and lecturing about democracy is not going to achieve our- Never worked in my marriage, it, so it, I can it, imagine that it might not. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't work with children either. Yeah, right. Uh, so, uh, what I, that's why I suggested, now I have no evidence that what follows a conversation, an outreach conversation by President Trump to President Erdogan is a conversation about the need not to repress the press or jail opposition figures. I am not privy to that. But I would say that if you, if you want to have a, a vehicle for having a private discussion, you have to have a relationship. And you have to give Erdogan the perception that he is being, being treated respectfully. He's not going to be responsive otherwise. And the, I think the only way to appeal to a leader on this kind of issue uh, effectively is to speak in the leader's self-interest. And that's a private conversation about the consequences of, of a country uh, being taken away from what its people have, have sought. And if the prospects for the Tur Turkish people over time are dimmed, are narrowed by these decisions, ultimately that's not going to redound favorably to the legacy of that leader. Now, there, this may not be effective with Erdogan. And it may take the cultivation of a series of Turkish leaders to get Turkey back on a more positive path. And the complication of the extremely difficult environment in which Turkey is currently operating in its neighborhood is such, as you pointed out, that Turkey has leverage. Uh, and if it is uh, not satisfied in its requests for uh, what it wants, it can then uh, uh, act contrary to the interests of the countries that uh, wanted it to put this, this stop on migration. Um, but that also speaks to the longer term. This is a little loud all of a sudden. Whoever's doing the sound. Uh, the, that also speaks to the imperative of having a collective ongoing dialogue with Turkey on a whole range of issues. I mean, th this is a very good example. Europe and Turkey are in this together. Europe, Europe needs to engage Turkey recognizing that this is not going to go away and that a 
constructive relationship with Turkey, as difficult as it may be, is in, is in Turkey's interest as it is in Europe's interest. And that's challenging, but necessary. And uh, one of the worries for Turkey today, I mean, I noted the, um, what's happened to the military, also the uh, other uh, agencies or departments of the government, um, there has been a purge of a lot of civil servants. So a lot of the longtime, what are called Kemalist civil servants are gone. And one of the questions for American policymakers is, who do you work with now? And do they have any influence? Uh, do they have any, any stroke? And we really don't know the answer to that. It's such a, an unsettled time. My view would be, therefore, that in the, in the government, we need to do everything we can to cultivate relationships. And we also need to do it in, with civil, Turkish civil society. And that's a place where uh, a place like this can really play a role. Uh, people are nervous, honestly, about association with us right now. It's one of the things I've observed is that there is fear of reprisal for coming to the United States or meeting with, mm -hmm. with um, those who would be seen as critical of the regime. So that's a challenge to think about, whether you do it in a third location uh, in some way that's, that's less um, potentially threatening to them. But we're going to have to be in, in this for the long term. And so it seems to me that the, a policy of isolation would not produce the results we seek, but we're going to need, but this will not be something that gets resolved in six months or a year in terms of turning him around. I do think the identification of some steps that can be taken and looking at the referendum, the ways in which that has the potential to be um, shaped less in a less damaging way or a more damaging way for Turkish democracy is important to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anybody else like to join in this discussion? Uh, Carl. Carl Kaiser. You, I, you should identify yourself even though I've identified Who you. Who needs no introduction? I'm, I'm Carl Kaiser, an associate of the Center and of the Weatherhead Center, and in my previous life, very much associated with this issue. Um, when I was uh, director of the German Council on Foreign Relations, when at that time I was very much in favor of uh, Turkish membership, and I had very powerful opponents mm -hmm. uh, in the government and on the Christian Democratic side. Mm -hmm. I have somewhat changed my position. and. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, when you look at the situation, um, of course, the European Union, Germany in particular, with three and a half million Turks, are deeply intertwined with Turkey. Yeah. There's no escapement. You yeah. rightly made that point. But the debate on the membership is extremely difficult now. Mm. Um, incidentally, uh, there's a lot of soul searching at the moment in Germany because 63% of the Turks who voted voted in favor of the Erdogan, 63 mm. percent. Fortunately, that is only 30 percent of the Turks living in Germany. But still, um, uh, and there are lots of questions. Why did they do that, living in a democratic country? So, but that's, uh, that's, a, that's another issue that is coming up and uh, will be of great importance. But what do you do at the moment when uh, it is extremely difficult to uphold even the notion mm -hmm. of keeping the door of negotiations open. Yeah. There, there, there are a number of countries and the majorities are absolutely against it. And sometimes it looks as if, as if the best option would be to just postpone the issue and say, let's postpone it, let's not, let's not negotiate at the moment. Uh, but as you know, Chancellor Merkel was deeply criticized when she did the, made that agreement uh, on the Turks. But she continues to insist that one needs Turkey. Uh, yes. on the whole refugee issue. Yes. Um, besides the fact that what happened now in the referendum has reminded the, the Germans in particular how deeply uh, they are in yes. connected w w with Turkey. So uh, your advice is a good one, um, but it's very difficult I wouldn't uh, put under, the focus under the present circumstances to maintain problem. that option. Very difficult. I wouldn't difficult. put the focus on it. I, I mean, I'm, I would be, if I were being asked from a policy perspective what to recommend, I would say. I would take the spotlight off membership. It's too neuralgic right now. I mean, frankly, the Turks don't want it right now. Right. And it, the situation in Europe is too turbulent. I mean, we've got countries, major, ma major countries, European countries thinking about exit from the EU. Yeah. So you know, the French elections may have pulled France back from the brink of that, but it is, it is not a time, I think, to take that on. So I would set it aside 
as a focus. I mean, we missed a moment. There's no question we missed a moment. I and mean, this was something to be addressed 10 years ago, eight years ago. And the moment has passed. And Turkey, unfortunately, I think, um, saw that reaction. And it was not, as I noted, uh, helpful in terms of uh, Turkey's thinking about its path. I don't think it is the cause of Turkey's uh, having gone off the rails in terms of Turkish democracy, but I think it had a negative impact. And so I would not put the focus on that, but I would put the focus on strong bilateral ties and, and an endeavor to keep Turkey in NATO, because that is at risk now. And that would be a huge breach to have Turkey after uh, having been in NATO since 1951 choose to leave NATO. It's going to take a lot of work to keep them in NATO. And uh, it's difficult. Uh, there are a lot of differences of views on policy. But I think the challenge of finding a way to deal <coughs> with a leader who is not uh, one that many of the European leaders want to deal with anymore uh, is, is, but we have this going on in some other European countries too, actually. So my sense is, unfortunately, that the, I mean, we have an extreme case. If you have a very extreme case, you might say isolation is the best policy, uh, North Korea. But in the European context, it seems to me that a, a policy to take a stance that you would not engage a leader of a major country in Europe on grounds that you disagree with his or her policies is, is short-sighted and a relationship needs to be sustained and truth needs to be spoken to power and important leaders need to do it leaders who have credibility and and a track record so can I give you a little bit of trouble here mm -hmm. um, uh, although there are clear responses to uh, what I'm going to say um, uh, uh, it's not very costly for the US to urge the Europeans to take Turkey Mm -hmm. into the European mm -hmm. Union, and uh, I think that would be very much in American interests. Uh, but I think we can reasonably question whether that would have been in European mm -hmm. interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we can even go farther than that and make myself even more unpopular in this room and say, uh, you know, when we see what's going on in Hungary, when we see what's going on in Poland, um, one, I think, might legitimately ask, uh, although there are two, ans two kinds of answers to this question, admittedly, but one might legitimately ask, um, you know, is, is a European Union that uh, had high aspirations for uh, political integration uh, not become a large free trade zone with subsidiary concerns about democracy and virtually no capacity to guarantee democracy in a way that uh, mm -hmm. was hoped when it won the mm -hmm. Nobel Peace Prize. So um, uh, the issue is not only about Turkey, but mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. seems to me that I could understand why uh, the United States would like to see Turkey in the EU. It's less clear to me uh, whether that would have been a good idea even 10 years ago. So I can argue both sides of it with you. And I agree with you that it was not a, um, as to use that much hackneyed phrase, a slam dunk. But most policy decisions, I mean, this is the, this is the where, where your brain has to adjust to the reality of being in, a, in the policy world. Policy decisions are rarely pure decisions. They're always full of um, compromises and unsatisfactory uh, aspects. And mm -hmm. uh, there is, you're often choosing um, among the lesser of evils versus mm -hmm. the optimal outcome. And I would say the, the concerns that European policymakers had, I describe the concerns that they felt after the NATO meeting that was disrupted uh, were legitimate concerns. The concerns about the flooding of European institutions by Turks and what would that mean and would they conduct themselves in a way that was like the way we do our business in Europe. At the same time, we live in this interconnected, interdependent world and we can't get away from the fact that in Europe, Turkey is of significant consequence. And this is the greatest chasm in the world today is, that has, has broken open is between the West and the Islamic world to face the reality that we can't make it work with a country that has been allied with us since the beginning of the 1950s is suggestive of a, a failure on an on a, I mean, epic scale. So 
It's not comfortable, and it had many downside risks, but the alternative may be worse. Fair enough. Anybody else like to enter this discussion? <laughs> Well, the, idea, the cost of that is I'll keep asking her questions, and you'll just have to sit there and listen to her answer, uh, or not answer, as the case may be. So here's my other, here's my next question, Liz. Um, I don't think this one's answerable. Uh, I've run through the Harvard answerable Harvard questions, questions are usually not answerable. I sat with blue books, and I knew that a long time ago. So. Uh, um, as if thinking as an American policymaker, regardless of administration. Uh, seeking desperately some resolution to the Syrian crisis. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what role should we be envisioning that Turkey will play in the solution to that crisis? Well, at what juncture are you discussing? The, current, the today, current juncture. Where, where today, now? Where we are today hoping to go forward. Yeah. Turkey is an essential part of any solution to mm -hmm. Syria. Um, I mean, people, if you're... Syria is, is obviously a, a, as one of those, Samantha Power's book, which is the problem from hell concept, Syria is definitely a problem from hell. And um, uh, you, if you're, are you asking me my view of what should you, be done in yeah, Syria? Yes, that's yes, a, that's, yes, a, that's yes, not a, oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I will say, yes, Turkey should be involved. If Turkey isn't involved, we won't have a durable solution. So far, I can agree with you. So uh, it's a very uncomfortable question, and I haven't been put on the record publicly about this since I left the administration. Um, I am more concerned about the uh, uh, metastasis of Islamic extremist groups in Turkey and beyond Turkey uh, than uh, I am about the and then, then I am about anything else right now in Turkey. Now, that suggests that I'm not uh, horrified by the humanitarian crisis and the actions of, of President Assad, which are heinous. But the nature of the threat we're facing from these multiple um, Islamic extremist groups is one that I believe we need to gather all the uh, capabilities we have to fight and constrain and defeat. And then there has to be a solution for Syria, which honestly, I, Cameron is here and, and you, Amanda, I've been thinking about Bosnia and Serbia and all the work we did in the Balkans and what kind of solution could the international community impose to try to stabilize Syria so that people are not being slaughtered. Because it's, and it's not optimal. Again, you go to the what's, the, is, these are not perfect solutions. Bosnia still struggles. There are all sorts of problems in Kosovo. But we did stop the major bloodshed. And we need to find a way to get, to create a situation in which human beings are not just being slaughtered in Syria. And constrain the influence of groups that are fundamentally inimical to our interests and, and want to to create an Islamic caliphate across the region. Mm -hmm. So that would be my first focus. It has been what I've worked on. Uh, and uh, it would be my, my goal to manage that dimension first. Mm -hmm. But it's very complicated. And uh, others may differ. I don't know what others mm -hmm. sitting here think. Mm -hmm. Ambassador. That would be great. Yes, please. Uh, you should identify yourself for the rest of the world here. And here's a microphone. Uh, my name is. It's on. My name is Cameron Munter. I'm a re, re, a um, recovering diplomat. Um, former foreign service officer. Former foreign usually. service officer. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I am currently the president of the East West Institute in in New York that does conflict uh, conflict prevention as best it can. Um, if you look at the current administration and the apparent choice that it seems to be making, I'm not sure this is true, but let's, let's guess at it, that it is choosing to see the th apparent threat from Iran mm -hmm. and Iran's proxies as a greater threat than some other, other threats. That is, taking the side that is espoused, say, by Israel or by Saudi Arabia or by Egypt or by Jordan, that the real problem is Iran 
-hmm. How would you, after looking in this, in this area, expand your assessment beyond just what Turkey does, but how other countries in the world might have an impact on Turkey? That is, what about the Turkish relationship with Iran? Well, is that part of, a, of an answer to this question? Mm -hmm. Is the Turkish relationship to Russia part of this question? Or is it merely a question for Turkey uh, to decide? Uh, uh, it, well, how, do you, how do you factor in the other countries? The rivalry between Turkey and Iran is historic, and it was our view that raising Turkey up in the regional context was a quite important strategic play. You'll remember this, I think, from the beginning of the administration. I actually didn't talk about that in these remarks, and it should be added, but uh, that was a, a calculus for us, uh, that we were trying to um, diminish Iran's influence uh, constrain Iran, impose sanctions on Iran, ultimately bring Iran to the negotiating table, address the nuclear problem, but that has not addressed the many other problems we face with Iran and its support for terrorism uh, in the region and around the world. And uh, Iran is playing a negative role in Syria and in Lebanon and in other places as well. Um, and. Uh, I am not at all supportive of the view that we should go after Iran right now and, and challenge it on uh, the grounds that the nuclear agreement is, uh, is an inadequate deal because I actually think that we uh, achieved something which creates um, security which our allies in the region did not have. Uh, and Iran was very close to the precipice of, of having nuclear weapons and that the rhetoric that is currently being used is very unhelpful in ensuring that on the Iranian side, the deal does not get undone. I mean, we have, each has to play to its domestic audience, right? And so there's a whole issue, uh, there's elections coming up in Iran, which also pit the hardliners who want, did not want to do this deal against those who thought this was to the benefit of Iran. So um, it is uh, ri a great risk, I think, for uh, Israel and our regional allies to uh, uh, threaten to undo this, this nuclear deal. But we also do face the pernicious influence of Iran in, in other ways in the region. And uh, we have not found an effective way to address that. And they're allied with the Russians in Syria, as you know. Yes, uh, please, um, just tell us who you are. I'm Amanda Sloat, a uh, fellow in the Ash Center at the, the Kennedy School and also served um, with, with Liz for part of her time there and then subsequent to, to Liz working on uh, Turkey for several years in the, in the State Department. Um, so I wanted to take you back to, to one of the issues you had, had alluded to, to us having worked on, which is the, the question of the Kurds, mm -hmm. um, which of course in addition to Iran are another very complicating factor in Syria. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I thought Cameron was going to say, and he went in the Iran direction, was was if, as Trump appears to do, uh, is likely to use the, the YPG, the Syrian mm -hmm. Kurds, mm -hmm. to lead the assault on ISIS in Raqqa, mm -hmm. uh, it's likely going to risk a very, very serious Greek rift with, with the Turkey. Turks. Yes. Um, and as mm -hmm. you know, this was a, a long conversation within the Obama administration. It's clearly something that the Trump administration is is wrestling with, which is essentially the, the synonymous links between the, the YPG and the, the PKK and the Turks seeing our cooperation with the YPG as being a very existential yeah. threat to, to themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so would be interested in, in your thoughts on how you see the Kurdish question more generally. Um, you obviously have tensions between Turkey and the PKK within Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, as you alluded to, a, a failed peace process, mm -hmm. um, ongoing conflict between the, the two sides now, and then, of course, in fighting the Islamic extremist elements that you rightly identified in Syria, uh, also coming back to, to what is seen as a very existential threat um, in, so, in Turkey. And I'll just, I'll, I'll say that I have approached the um, information that we have about the nature of the various groups that are operating in Syria with some skepticism. I have never been confident that we had sufficient understanding of their orientation, and the YPG is one. And there have been questions raised about the extent to which they are a group that we should 
support, or as the Turks believe, they are um, antithetical to Turkish interests. And frankly, in the course of the last, since 2011, that has evolved. So we, it's, it has never been um, a, a static situation. And uh, it is true that among the evils with which we are dealing in Syria, the Kurdish forces appear to be, and I noted this in my remarks, the force that we would most likely want to align with um, in seeking to hold territory. Uh, that does not resolve the issue you raised, which is the enormous concern the Turks have about the implications of emboldening or empowering or strengthening the Kurdish forces. And I think that takes me back to something that I think is truly tragic, which is the, the uh, collapse of the peace process and the reversal of the opening to the Kurds that was really promising in Turkey in which there were Kurds being elected to parliament and a constructive process underway and a real hope for a multi-ethnic society. And, and it is shocking to see what has happened to that now. And uh, the optimal solution would be to find our way back to that, but that's, or for the Turks to find their way back to that, but that's a very long way off because of the, uh, in particular, the, the fragmentation of Syria so I don't have a good answer for the question, uh, but I do think the longer term issue that has presented itself undoubtedly, and this was something that I believed from the outset in 2011, is that the quest of the, Turkish, of the Kurdish people for contiguous territory that is governed by the Kurdish people is something that's going to have to be engaged. Uh, the changes in this region to the territory uh, that have taken place since 2011 as a result of the dismemberment of Syria and what has happened in Iraq are such that it's inevitable that that's going to present itself. And that has not been addressed, but it's there for us all to see as something coming at us. Okay. Other views? Yes, in the front here. Thanks, Laura. So something to be worked on by people like you. Tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm uh, Fotini Christian, I'm Associate Professor of Political Science at MIT. I really appreciated your point about constructive engagement and how, despite uh, the politics in Turkey, we cannot be alienating uh, the leadership. But I did want to hear more about how you would advise someone who's in the administration now mm -hmm. about going about it without actually entrenching mm -hmm. the cleavages that exist. I mean, it's pretty clear that it's a very deeply divided society. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a place where there are many concerns about academic freedom yes. and about an array of different freedoms. And I, I wondered how you speak truth to power in that mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. and what the leverage is. Um, Carl made the point about the Turks in Germany voting in favor. In the US, for example, 89% voted against. Uh, so I think it's an interesting, right. demo a very different demographic. Right. Um, and a kind of a very different approach as many Turks in uh, the cities. So I wonder um, how one can take a stance yeah. that doesn't make the other half feel like they're being left behind. Right. right. Well, I'm going to set aside that just, a, a, it's sort of the elephant in the room for all of us. I don't know if the Trump administration is capable of doing this yet because we don't have people in place, there aren't ambassadors chosen, there's no deputy secretary of state or under secretaries or assistant secretaries, the kind of people who actually go out and do our foreign policy. Uh, and of course we all are, for those of us who are consumers of news, we're watching every day to try to understand what is happening. So I just have to set that elephant over here because I can't answer your question otherwise. But let's, let's posit that we get to a place where there's a functioning foreign policy machine again, and people who have been given guidance that their mission is to go and engage in a way that does not strengthen the hand of those who are the oppressors and weaken those who are being oppressed. That's what you're asking me. And I think I've seen this happen in a number of cases where the United States has the 
the power, the presence to go to a country and to meet with leadership and to meet with opposition groups and to give speeches to civil society where civil society is being squeezed and to use the media and have a plan that is to create momentum for something different. It's really hard. It requires uh, ad advanced thinking about the whole concept. You can't just sort of blunder into it. You have to anticipate what you're going to do and work with your people on the ground and develop it and sustain it and do it repeatedly. Uh, but my view would be with Turkey, there is enough civil society, even though terrible things have happened. There are enough people in the opposition who care. There is a young Turkish population that's quite divided. The data is that many young Turks have supported Erdogan because they believe he has given space to be more observant religiously in what had previously been a society in which that was not acceptable. And so if there's a way to bring him and his, his party to a place of recognition that that's OK, but that can't be to the exclusion of everybody else, you could find a way forward again. So my hope would be an American policy that is comprehensive in its outreach to Turkey. It can't only be that you call Erdogan and congratulate him, obviously. But that's, that, is the, that is one small step in the direction of building a dynamic that would engage with, with Turkish society writ large. And we'll have to see if we get there. It certainly would have been I mean, we, we did this in a number of countries uh, in the course of the um, Obama administration. And you can evaluate in each case how it worked and how it didn't work. And the thing is, history has a, has a life of its own. So it doesn't necessarily happen on your timeline, on your, on your clock as an administration. Yes. Uh, right uh, in the center there. Oh, great. <coughs> uh, hi, I am Jemin. Uh, Turkish student at Harvard Business School. Uh -huh. uh, I would like to get your views on changing the paradigm from focusing on threats like negative language, negative rhetoric, or downsides in the region to the like opportunities mm -hmm. or how we can create like economic mm -hmm. fostering, how we can leverage mm -hmm. upsides to create stability. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify. Mm -hmm. Uh, going back to roots of European Union after World War One, they were only like focusing on negative measures on Germany, let's say, mm -hmm. and which resulted in the Second World War, mm -hmm. and then paradigm just shift with yes. the brilliant idea of European Union, just how yeah. we can use like economy, a coal union to create a fostering in mm -hmm. the region. Mm -hmm. I have a sense that in the region we are still dealing with the following, like we are still in the phase of after World War One, <laughs> like still looking at the whole like rhetoric in last 90 minutes. What are the threats? What are the downsides? What are the costs? How we can minimize them? But if you change it, like what are the opportunities in the region in terms of economic fostering or political union? For instance, Middle East is the only region without, with, without any economic regional uni mm -hmm. union. Mm -hmm. So what are the opportunities that we can leverage and create stability and we can learn from European Union project and apply in the region. Thank you. So I'm happy for this question. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned in the remarks that we had sought to expand the relationship to significantly grow the commercial and economic dimension of the relationship as a bulwark and something that would move Turkey forward democratically because of the way in which trade and investment creates incentives for continuing to have a an economy with the kinds of structure, legal structures, regulatory structures that are consistent with, with um, continuing that kind of commerce. And um, I do think that Turkey in particular with regard to energy resources for Europe um, has the potential, that area for Turkey has the potential to be um, a way to find uh, a path to greater cooperation because uh, the need for energy security in Europe is great. Russia has exercised its leverage in very uh, threatening ways for a number of countries. And the gas corridor through Turkey, for example, is a very significant one for 
giving Turkey, giving Europe alternative sources of, of supply. So I think given that you're at the business school, this is an opportunity for you to the extent that the private sector is able to not only create opportunity for Turks, but also create incentives for the leadership of Turkey to see that the direction it is taking is not helpful to the economy, that will over time be valuable. Because a government needs to show its people results. And if the economy continues to go down and the lira continues to deteriorate in its value, that does not, it's not a positive for the president of Turkey. And uh, so this can be applied in many other sectors as well. And we had a number of initiatives underway with Turkey for growth of, of commercial cooperation, many of which have stalled. Uh, but the, the possibility of what we, I think of it as commercial statecraft, which is a very powerful tool in building relationships and incentivizing democratic practice. So I think we'll take um, uh, one or two more questions. We'll collect a couple and uh, then we'll uh, close, which, because uh, there is a reception afterwards and you're all invited upstairs for uh, a, a little bit of food and drink. But, uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions there, the, maybe the lady in the back and then the gentleman in the front. Uh, please identify yourself. Mary Ann Boswell, and I'm at Mass General, but moving to a, a spin-off where we are, um, we are helping places like Turkey create a cancer genomic testing lab. And actually our first lab is going to be in Istanbul. My question is, is, is I just want to interrupt for a second. This is, a, this is an example of just what I was saying. So this arena is one of the arenas in which we were interested in, in growing cooperation in, in pharmaceuticals and medicine. So, so um, we, have a, we, have a, an we have a person in Turkey who wants to open this lab. Mm -hmm. And there has just been so much change and so much, so much mm -hmm. turmoil mm -hmm. that it's really creating a skittishness. Mm -hmm. um, and we have done things like talk to the State Department, talk to the, you know, the Department of Commerce to try to understand what we can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just enough different that it creates... Too much risk. It, right? it creates a concern for risk, <laughs> yes. which is part of why, one of the reasons why we have now this spin out, which is going to be mm -hmm. owning part of this project. Mm -hmm. But if you have any advice on where we can turn, on what we can do to become more informed, mm -hmm. uh, it would be great. Well, I think you have indicated you've been in contact with the Department of Commerce, with the Commercial Service, and also if you have not had satisfaction in talking to the DC-based Department of Commerce, I would go on the State Department website and find my way to the commercial officer in the embassy in Ankara. Uh, or there is a consulate in Istanbul where there's an excellent consul general and you could be in touch with them. I, what I might do is, is go straight to Turkey rather than try to work with people in DC, but to our representatives there uh, and discuss with them the circumstances and ask for their advice. And probably you are right to be cautious at the moment about making a major investment because we really don't know what is going to so unfold. So we're actually not making any investment. Uh-huh. We're, we are. We're not making any investment. We are providing services. And, and being paid for the services by the Turks? By, by the, the businessman. I mm -hmm. think that our concern is, um, MGH has been very conservative traditionally, mm -hmm. with good reason, and um, we want to make sure this is a success. We've actually walked away from a previous engagement where we felt that the people we were dealing with really didn't have, I mean, this is really esoteric medical mm -hmm. stuff. Um, we didn't feel that they really mm -hmm. could be successful. I, I think it's worth, I think, I mean, my advice is talk to our folks on the ground who really know the landscape get their advice. And uh, one last uh, question there, I think, or one com last comment, just in front of you. Hello. Hello, my name's Aytaç. I'm from Turkey. I'm a visiting scholar here. That's I'm sorry, Harvard. I couldn't hear anything you said. My name's Aytaç. Yeah. I'm from Turkey. I'm a visiting scholar here at Harvard. Uh -huh. 
Uh, thank you for your... Where are you uh, doing your scholarship here? Where are you located? Uh, Here uh, at the center or somewhere else? No, no, not center. I am affiliated to IQSS and also I'm associated to the Department of Government. Great. And uh, thank you for your uh, nice uh, retros retrospective vision for turkish american relations. It was very nice. And uh, since the hot topic these days is the Syrian issue, yeah. Syrian crisis, yeah. and uh, since we are talking about constructive engagement with Turkey in the future, both in relations with U.S. and EU. Uh, don't you think that uh, it will be more easy for U.S. to deal with Syrian crisis, especially against ISIS, for example, instead of some Kurdish forces uh, with a long-term uh, ally, Turkey? Uh, coming from 1950s very intensively, but uh, it started long before that. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be more easy to uh, deal with Syrian crisis together with Turkey. And do you think, and you mentioned that uh, during Obama administration in the first year, who was to be invited to the White House was important sign for the uh, world. And in the May, uh, Turkish president invited to White House. So do you think this is a sign to the world that U.S. will walk together with mm -hmm. Turkey? So I think we've never actually stopped trying to work with Turkey on Syria. And there has been extensive effort to align ourselves in a way that advanced shared interests. And our military leadership has repeatedly traveled to Turkey. Of course, as I noted, the challenge right now is there has been a complete uh, decapitation of the Turkish military leadership because of the purges. And so the people that we have known and worked with are not there. And there is great uncertainty about how to work with the Turkish military at the moment. And nevertheless, we continue to try. And I would say that has not been abandoned. Uh, and that the invitation to come is a part of a, a, an initial gesture, just as the phone call was, to build a constructive relationship, recognizing that we must find a way forward. What happens in that discussion I cannot predict, and it will depend upon the staffing that will need to be done for the new president. And um, we as I noted with the elephant, we don't know the answer to the question yet of what that will look like. But we should all be speaking out on this, on the importance of, of finding a constructive way forward and, and um, uh, helping uh, as, as, is, as friends do. Sometimes friends say the hardest things to each other if you're a true friend. You don't do it in front of other people, you do it privately. And so I'm, that would be my my advice if I were asked. Thank you. So um, let me remind you, you're all very welcome to have a drink and something to eat upstairs. Do I get a and drink? we can carry on this conversation <laughs> being that way. Interrogated uh, about Syria? Liz, thank you very, very much. <laughs> a very enlightening. Thank you all.